Hey guys, it's your boy, Jacob Pearson, coming to you from Legend Story Studios. Today, we're talking about Prism, Awakener of Soul, possibly a consideration for you to take to your upcoming ProQuest. So today we're going to take a look at Bispa, uh, who is an absolute champion who went on a tier at the recent Calling Phuket, going undefeated in Swiss and ending up making it to an unfortunate loss in the semi-finals. But today I'm going to be walking you through his deck, some of the other deck building considerations you can make when looking to make your own Prism deck at home and where Prism sets in the metagame. Basically, just an all-to guide on how to Prism Awaken Hour of Soul. So getting right, right into it, well, I just want to talk about how Prism sits in today's metagame. So obviously, Prism, really, really powerful hero. In fact, I'm happy to go on record saying she is capable of the most powerful things in the game currently in Classic Constructed. She is the highest output when everything goes right, capable of some truly, truly amazing things. Now, that comes at a cost. Obviously, the hero being 32 life means that she is quite fragile and she plays all these things like figments um, and other cards that have what I like to refer to as pearls, which is no defense value, meaning that she is often forced into taking very, very aggressive lines. However, with all the Herald cards introduced in Dusk of Dawn and her new weapon, she is very, very, very good at putting down those numbers. Now, things that she can struggle into as well is obviously the key mechanic in, uh, in this deck being Phantasm. Now, Phantasm attacks are illusionist attacks that typically have over curve or above rate stat lines. In return for this, they can actually be des destroyed on your turn by your opponent defending with an attack action, non illusionist attack action card with six power or greater. Now, this means that if I'm pitching a card to attack you with a herald and you block with one card and destroy it, I don't get go again, I, I lose a lot of tempo, and it can be really, really hard to recover from that. So it makes sense that the high matchups for this deck will be brutes. Guardians, things with a lot of these six power popper kind of effects, where they're able to pop your heralds basically at nauseum and at will um, to really, really uh, make your day a, a little bit harder. Now, there's a, a few things that you can do to mitigate this when you're playing an aggressive prism strategy like the one that Vespa was. Um, and we'll walk through that as we talk about all the cards in Vespa's deck. But as, it is key to know that these matchups can be quite difficult, especially if you're an inexperienced prism pilot. There's a lot of nuance to this deck, a lot of really small key interactions that you'll pick up from game to game. In fact, I think it is one of the most rewarding experiences in Flesh and Blood to play and learn how to take apart, pick apart all these little lines that are available to you over the course of these games. And I, even now, having played hun literally hundreds of hours on, on Prism Awakener of Soul, I still find myself learning things from game to game. Um, where to value what, all, all these really, really cute little things that you can do that I'll walk you through as we talk through the cards. There is so, so much depth to this here, it's amazing. So if you are to try this at home, just please be aware that it will take some time to get comfortable with this deck and really, really fine tune your knowledge of how to play an aggressive Herald Prism deck. Now that being said, let's get right into the deck list here that I've got in front of me, like we said before from Vespa at the recent Calling Phuket. Now we're gonna start with equipment. And equipment for Prism is really interesting. Your headpiece and this deck I think is the strongest equipment in the game in any format and this specific hero. Now I don't know if any of you picked up on what this might be but Halo of Illumination. This card single-handedly tutors a card from your deck and puts a herald into your soul. These two effects in conjunction mean that Cards like the Stage of Soul are now turned on. We are able to get additional resources from your pitch cards. You can get the key card you need at any point during the game. And you can get cards in Soul to pay for your Angel Attack effects or other effects like Celestial Cataclysm it is maybe a more minor one that you might come up, see come up sometimes. This card is a must-have. Um, it, luckily, it is a common from Monarch, I believe. But it is a must in the deck. It is where a lot of this deck's power comes from. And where a lot of Prism was actually designed around was this card, Halo of Illumination. Every, everything else you can chop and change a little bit. Like we see, 
Vespa playing quite a few equipments here, but mostly these come in the form of arm slot equipments. Now your other three slots as Prism are pretty key. So you either want Imperium Rapture, or as I mentioned earlier, Vestige of Soul are your two chest options. Now, Imperium Rapture is kind of your default go-to go when you're playing a, an aggressive hero strategy, right? You're wanting that free flip of the angels as you're constantly laying down these big attacks, big attacks, big attacks, and you just getting those effectively two resources for free when the first time you hit with a hero is huge. If any other deck had that kind of, kind of power, imagine something that said, when your attack, first time an attack you control hits, gain two resources, that's an extremely powerful effect for a chest. Now obviously, it, it comes, comes at a cost, right? It doesn't have defense value, although the once per turn ward effect on the card can come up. Uh, it, is, it is very, very important for when you're in these aggressive matchups where you're not expecting your opponent to be popping, uh, a lot of your herald attacks and you're expecting them to just trying to either block out and take the odd hit so you can really get that value cranking along. Really, really good card against these, these low pop account decks or in, in the aggressive aggro mirrors. As playing this deck, it can be extremely aggressive. However, when we're talking about Vestige of Soul, this card's really good in the matchups where we are a bit more on the defensive, where they can reliably pop our attacks, re reliably stop our heroes from being able to go through. Because what this card does is essentially, in conjunction with a few of the auras, al allow us to put cards in a soul very easily, which then means that we can play our full cost yellow instant speed auras for, with pitching a single card. Very strong effect, also works very, very well in conjunction with cards like Tome of Divinity um, and just really get your, your engine churning in the matchups where you can't reliably go attack with a Herald with go again from your weapon, pitching a yellow card, attack possibly with an Angel because your Herald hit and then finishing it off with another Herald attack. Really, really key card for those popper matchups like Guardians, like Brutes. Very, very cool card. And then talking about the arms again, Let's go through the options, because Vespa's got quite a few. So the first one that he has is Dreamweavers. Now Dreamweavers, really, really cute card. Basically it says it's a one-time use of Passing Mirage, the blue aura from Everfest, that says your first illusionist attack each turn loses and can't gain Phantasm. This is essentially that on an arms. Good if you're wanting to guarantee something pushing through. Like if you have something like a Herald of Erudition, followed up with some Angelic Wrath possibly in hand, where you know pretty reliably that your attack's gonna go through if they don't have the popper. And it can be key for, for some of those matchups. Then we have Gambler's Gloves. Gambler's Gloves, obviously you know Brutes love their scabskin rolls, and sometimes just being able to turn that two action point turn into a one, or even perhaps a zero action point turn, can be really key. Obviously it's not 100% to work, it is a gamble after all, but even being at least 50% to turn them off uh, from that two action point turn can be absolutely huge. Very, very fine choice. Then we have Null Rune Gloves. You notice only one point of Arcane Barrier here. Now, you would possibly think that it might struggle with matchups like Kano. However, Angels having Ward 4 is really, really good at stopping these big sources of Arcane damage. They're a bit worse against stuff like Rune Chants. However, all you need against Rune Chants and other, like, lots of little sources of Arcane damage is obviously Arcane Barrier 1. And against these big sources, you actually have an alternate source of defending against these things. So only one source of Arcane Barrier, totally reasonable, and it's in the least important slot here, as we were talking through before. Um, one include that Vespa doesn't have, which I, I rate quite reasonably high, is Goliath Gauntlet. Now Goliath Gauntlet is in a similar realm to Dreamweavers, but it expects you to have the other end of the spectrum where you want to have the Cel Celestial Reprimand to make sure that they don't have the popper, or in matchups where they don't reliably pop. Things like Kasai, Warriors, um, they don't have very, very many poppers, and often their poppers are only six power, which means that um, some of our heralds uh, will give them minus one attack, or our figment can play around them, uh, which means that we're able to push through these effects really reliably, and getting the extra plus two on a seven power our hero triumph means it's coming for nine stripping at least three cards with a value which is pretty fantastic 
And lastly, we have the wave of reality. Um, wave of reality, just a solid all-round option when you're not really sure where you're supposed to be in the matchup. As it, creating a spectral shield token, very, very powerful effect in this deck as it's able to help you maneuver around lots of small sources of damage. If you think of something like Katsu's Kadachis, they are really, really troublesome for your angels as these sources of one, one, one means that you're either letting the, the angel die to this puny, tiny little attack, or you're giving up a card from hand. Neither of those scenarios are things that you really want to be doing playing this deck. But other than that, of course, we have the mandatory Phantasmal Footsteps. This card is just an absolute all-star. Now, it means that against those popper de pesky popper decks, you can continue playing your turn, um, sometimes being able to sidestep into a blue aura, or even just another attempt at a herald attack can be really, really key. One really nice thing to, to know about this card is the interaction with Merciful Retribution. So if they are going to, uh, when you're playing this alongside Vestige of Soul, now, if they attempt to pop one of your Herald attacks, what's going to happen is you can stack the triggers so that their Herald will go to your soul first, you get your search for the figment, and then you'll be able to pitch for the Phantasmal Footsteps, generating an extra resource. Now, if you weren't to state that and you misorder it, you would be losing out on a potential extra resource for the turn. Really, really uh, nice little interaction to note there. Then, moving along to the, the meat of the deck, the, where all the heralds lie, where all the figments are, where all the good stuff is, and we'll, we'll start by talking about one, one, one of the boogeymen of playing uh, Prism, the Great Library of Solana. Now, this is a fable card from all the way back in Monarch, the first landmark card. Um, it is a really, really powerful effect. Now, there's obviously big downsides to playing this card. I do not think that this card is strictly necessary for the strategy, and on... I'd say half the use cases of it, it's sometimes a win more card. Um, and drawing it in, in the late game where you need to be closing with heralds, it can be extremely awkward. Now, that saying, once, if you get this effect online, it can be extremely hard to lose against decks that don't pop because your output simply just becomes absurd as long as you're keeping library ticking from turn over turn over turn. Because a five card hand for you looks like pitch, play herald, herald pitch, attack with angel, pitch, play herald, right? So that's, if you, if you count that, that's five cards, and you can just do that endlessly, just endlessly, and it's bringing so much damage to your opponent, you're basically stripping your opponent down every turn while generating additional value off figments, sometimes maybe even dumping an aura down, missing out on an angel attack, that kind of thing. It can be extremely, extremely powerful. Um, but like I said earlier, not necessary for the deck, and it can even be de detrimental. I, I think there's actually a lot of discourse in Prism um, whether it's actually correct to, to run this card. I personally like it because if the matchup, you can play some matchups in a way where things can get a little bit on the grindier side, and it isn't too hard to find a spot for library, but you really need to be playing the card or arsenaling the card. If you, if you leave this card straight in your hand and you choose to attack with, with a Herald instead, you're effectively giving yourself an IP penalty for the turn, making it harder to, to get it out, um, and you're obviously not going to be able to defend as well on the opposing Hero's turn. One key interaction to note here is when playing alongside Empyrean Rapture, uh, this once per turn instant ward effect you can be used to pitch to pay for library. Um, what I mean by that is you can have a three card hand, two yellows and a library and actually turn library online with using Imperium Rapture as a pitch outlet. So it would be something along the lines of pitch, play library, re library resolves, and now I'll pitch my second yellow card to activate Rapture for basically no effect. Um, but this gets the second yellow in our pitch zone, which means we would go up to five intellect and be able to proceed with a five card hand turn, which is quite nice. Moving on to the reds, reds are an interesting thing for this deck. Now, you need such a high density of yellows, and a lot of your blues and illusionists are very, very good. So I'd say anywhere from 9 to up to 15 on the high end is probably where you want to sit for reds. You can forego some of the blues. It does make things like your auras and your arc light sentinels a little bit harder to play. Um, but in return for that, you have a better aggro matchup. So decks like Kasai, 
hatchet story, those kind of things, they really want to be blocking two cards on your herald. So when your herald's coming in for six, you're not really getting any additional points of value. But when they're, they're coming in for seven, if they, they don't have dynamo up, um, or you have a second seven in the turn, that's when things can get really, really dicey for them, um, and they can really, really struggle to cover up your attacks. Um, so we see here, Herald of Protection, Herald of Triumph, and Watune Herald. These three, in my personal opinion, I think are the best candidates for red. There's also an argument to be made for uh, Rebirth and Tenacity. Now, Rebirth is a herald that says when it hits, you can basically stack a herald from your graveyard on top of your deck, then you shuffle and search for a figment. So if you're playing possibly against decks like Azuri, where the games can go really, really long and they can try and really drag things on, um, you can make sure that you've you'll keep pumping these, these heralds in through your deck, um, and it can be quite nice for, for just that, the, those extra couple of power cards in the deck. Um, tenacity is good in that it's just dominate, forcing through the on-hit, search your deck for a figment, put it into play, get the effect. Really, really strong. And some matchups where they're quote-unquote fridgeless, uh, they can't really play around these dominate effects, and they really, really get juice because it's just like, oh, I just don't have any way of covering this attack up um, and just forcing it through. So there's consideration for that. Now, why I think these three are the, the best examples, well, well, we'll start with the easiest one, which is Warchune Herald. It's a one for seven. It's just the best rate. Um, the way a lot of your resources line up on your turn is if you can go pitch uh, a, a yellow, attack with a Herald. I pitch a blue, I attack with my Angel. I have one floating, attack with Warchune Herald. Or simply pitch attack with a Herald. It gets popped by my opponent. And that means I can just pitch a, uh, a yellow, pay for my footsteps, and then follow up with a Warchune Herald. Um, just really, really nice. Fits into your curve super, super well. Um, I'd be really surprised to see any Prism deck that doesn't play nine of this card. And the same thing can be said for Herald of Triumph. Now this card is slightly different axis, but if you think about the, the, the footsteps thing, you're kind of pseudo saving a pop and a resource. A lot, of, a lot of decks in the format run a lot of six power, not many seven power cards, which means that this card is, in the most part, outside of some Guardian decks, etc. For, for the most part is basically just two for seven on hit, get a figment. Fantastic rate, fantastic card. You need to play nine of this. Even the plat taking with the blue one is you're still stripping two cards. You know it's most likely not getting popped really, really good. And we're talking about uh, Spectral Shields with Wave of Reality and how important they were, which is why I think Herald of Protection is really good. Um, Herald of Protection, especially against decks like Katsu, where they're like I said, lots of small attacks. It just lets you protect the angel that you can make on your turn after you search the figment by making that spectral shield. Like if you're going uh, Herald of Protection, it hits, you get the shield, you search for the figment that creates a spectral shield. Now you have two spectral shields. Well, that's Kadachi's covered and, and you're kind of good to, to continue your turn. Let your uh, the angel hit the, the surging strike or the, or the whelming or what have you. You're just in a really, really nice spot and it's a lot more comfortable for you to play. I think the less experienced Prism pilots can definitely lean on these types of effects more as a crutch to help you navigate through some of the more difficult turns. Really, really good stuff. And now, well, before we go to the yellows, because the yellows is the biggest section about this deck, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through the blues. Um, just as a, a side note, um, one, one potential card that you can consider in red as well, when, uh, we, we, if you want to up your red count slightly, is Angelic Wrath. Um, if you're playing against the, the more populist decks and you don't mind uh, shaving off some cyborg space for your harder matchups, you can re get a really, really strong matchup there. As getting over these things is really, really difficult. Like you, you can't can't play around it. The numbers are just fantastic. Like we, we see uh, our, our friend here plays Blue Angelic Wrath. Um, so you, you can kind of get the idea. The, this, this type of effect, especially when it's overrate, zero for four pseudo attack reaction is effectively overrate. There's a reason why it has a pearl um, and, and doesn't defend. Uh, it can be very, very good. Um, I wouldn't max out on three of these if you were to consider playing it, uh, as they can get quite bricky uh, and multiples. And you really need to be able to, to Arsenal one if, they, if you think that they might have the reactor. You're not able to quite push it there where you want it or save it for something like an air edition. Onto the blues. Uh, we see 
18 blues in, in this list. A um, little bit on the higher side, I think most people settled settle around the, the 15 mark, but 18, totally reasonable. We see, like I mentioned, Blue Angelic Wrath, gr great for all, the, mention, all the, the reasons I mentioned previously. Blue Herald of Protection, again, I think that this card's a fantastic nine of. Blue Herald of Triumph, again, fantastic nine of, does exactly what you want to do in the deck. Blue Passing Mirage, this card is the best aura in the deck, especially if you're an, a newer Prism pilot. This card saves your life. Even the matchups when they don't play a lot of poppers, just knowing that you're not gonna get your attack popped is so, so valuable. Just being able to plan your turn around it and just know that you've got that safety net of passing Mirage there is beautiful. One thing to note as well with this card, uh, when you attack with angels, if you attack with an angel first on your turn, it's not an illusionist attack. Um, they, they do not have the illusionist tag, so passing Mirage will not trigger on them. So you're then able to follow up with a Herald with no Phantasm, if you would like to order it that way. So, something nice to know. Um, but again, great card. The blue aura is fantastic at sidestepping. Um, if they want to block out your turn, um, you, you can just go Herald, they pop you, you're like, okay, passing Mirage. Or they you go attack with Herald, they're like, Yep, block it out. You attack with Angel, they're like, oh, I need to cover up his second hero that I know is coming, so I'm not going to block this. They take the damage, maybe get le left with a stranded card in hand that they're not able to utilize fully, and then you can close on the, the Passing Mirage or the, the other blue aura that's in this deck. Fantastic card. Really, really key in the deck. Um, would not consider playing any less than three of this card. It is that good. Pierce Reality Blue. Um, now, this is the other blue aura they chose to play. Um, I see anywhere between zero to three copies of this deck in aggressive prism lists can get a little bit on the clunkier side. Um, getting the density of heralds in your deck is really, really important. Um, even the attacking with blue heralds is really good. So you do have a cost of running this one in this deck. I think Passing Mirage is definitely a must for a three of. Um, PS Reality uh, is really, really strong turn one play. Obviously, any aura in the game on turn one, being Illusionist. If you've ever played Illusionist and played an aura on turn one, you know how good it feels. Um, PS Reality does a really good job of making your overcurve attacks even more overcurve, right? Like your, your one for nines, two for nines, um, with just so, so much value. And a lot of the time, uh, the opposing player, especially if they're on more poppers, won't necessarily value getting rid of this card, which means that over the course of the game, especially alongside things like Celestial Reprimand, um, can really, really like juice in terms of value. But there is a little bit of a cost basis in playing this card. However, we, we see this gentleman here really, really valuing this kind of effect and this kind of value generation from, from turn to turn. Really, really strong card. But if you want to shave this for a little bit more consistency, I could definitely see playing a Herald in this place or even going a little bit lower on the blue count. Kind of in a, a similar vein to Angelic Wrath, this is much more a, uh, a tech choice or a personal preference. Um, these, these are quite a few things you can play in this card. Me, personally, if, uh, in my Prism decks, I don't play Blue Angelic Wrath, but it's simply because I really, really value having flexibility in my Blues playing the deck, um, which is why I like running another Herald in the slot as well. And then obviously, capping off the Blues, Blue Watching Herald, fantastic stuff, nothing needs to be said here. Now, for the meat and the potatoes, um, we have the ever-looming, ever-famous ALS, the Arc Light Sentinel. This is a six-cost aura, very expensive, can be hard to play in this deck sometimes, but that's okay. The effect is really, really important for some matchups. Now, you don't necessarily need this in the aggro matchups where you're playing Empyrean Rapture as your chest. Um, as the cost is really, really high, you play so many pearls already in the deck, you don't have a lot of flexibility with the this card. It can be caught up awkward in Arsenal without the ability to generate the extra resources from Vestige. Um, so I can see siding out some number of this in the aggressive matchups. But for your more densely packed popper decks like your Brutes, like Ko, Reina, or your, or your Guardians like Victor Bravo, ALS sends them packing. Now Playing ALS out just by itself doesn't really achieve much, right? You're basically having to invest an entire turn's worth of resources to get a turn back from them, right? It's very easy just to play this card completely at parity. However, where this card really shines is alongside things like a turn where, let me give an example, we have Vestige of Soul, we activate our Halo, we put a Herald into our Soul, we search for a Figment, 
all our cards now pitch for one more. We pitch a blue, we play a Tome of Divinity, we draw three cards, and now you can see where I'm going with this. We want to play multiple auras, maybe a uh, Genesis or a Merciful, alongside an Arclight Sentinel, means that they have to spend their whole turn killing the Arclight. We get to keep the Genesis or keep the Merciful, and from that point, that's where we were able to snowball these kind of matchups. They can feel like an absolute grind. Playing against Guardian and Brute on Prism, can just feel like a hopeless, hopeless endeavor, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, if you manage to maneuver your way through the game properly, you can definitely get a reasonable matchup out of what feels like an impossible one. It truly does feel like that when you first start playing Prism and playing against Guardian, you're just like, oh, head in your hands. How can I ever maneuver my way through this? But there is a way. Um, if you think back to the, the old Prism, um, if you played during the Monarch days, Old Prism was very, very good at just playing a couple of auras down and then chipping away with the, them for very, very cheap thanks to the old version of Luminaris. And New Prism can't do that, but the things that made that matchup tick were the things like Genesis, were the, 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 these things like Merciful, where if they are left alone, they generate so much value and advantage for the Prism pilot. Now, because it's very, very difficult for us to get those big board states in, in this Prism deck, we really have to work for it, do those big setup turns with, with even Halo, um, Tome of Divinity, or Arclight Sentinel. We need some combination of these things in order to create these spots to pivot. Just throwing out Herald after Herald into them uh, over and over again is not going to end up well for you. You really need to try and, as you're playing through the turns, come up with a plan for how you're going to walk through the game. There is no set in stone way for these matchups. However, over time, you'll, you will feel what, what, what is right in the moment. There is no set in stone way to, to get it like this. I'll, I'll move on from Alice now, but we'll, we'll talk back to the auras more in a second. On to Celestial Cataclysm. Now, this is might seem a bit strange um, for, uh, for those of you who maybe play one or two games of uh, Prism, but what ends up happening in these like long, drawn-out games, as we were talking about before, against these Guardians and these Brutes with all these poppers, is you generate a lot of cards in Soul. So when you pitch these, they end up in your deck later for the game, and then BAM! Zero for seven go again, really, really strong. Uh, most importantly, they're a yellow card that defends for three. Very, very flexible. And this deck has to play a lot of these cards to make sure the deck keeps ticking along. Like you see, the majority of this deck is in fact yellow. It does meet that criteria. And also is a seven power popper, uh, which in the mirror is really important that the number is seven and not six. Uh, because it plays around all kinds of different effects in this deck. And also, for week one of ProQuest, you're going to have to deal with Dramai, um, as you'll most likely LL after them. But till then, uh, some amount of poppers does make that matchup a bit easier. That matchup can be a struggle at times. It's really, really hard to manage the, the board of dragons and attacking their face. While being the illusionist with a lot of life total, it can get a little bit dicey. This card keeps the pressure on, is a popper. Fantastic card. Now we have all the figments. And the fun part, uh, I talk about all, all the synergies and maybe some, some tips and tricks for you. Uh, Figment of Erudition, definitely the most important um, power, power level wise for the deck out of all the Figments. Now, when you, this card enters the arena, you create a Ponder token, um, which means that you basically get a free card. Very, very nice just to be able to search it out on your first Herald hit. When you're going second and you just go pitch, herald, pitch, herald, that they let the second herald hit, you search erudition, you draw up, you get a five card hand for next turn. Mwah, chef's kiss. That's the flesh and blood I like to be playing. Now, the even more important part of this card is the other side. Soraya, uh, the, the angel that this turns into, uh, as an effect that for one measly card in soul, uh, you can turn it into draw two cards. Now, who doesn't love drawing cards, am I right? Now, sometimes it can be a little bit hard to convert these cards into additional damage, especially if you've kept multiple cards already and then you're attacking, drawing more. Uh, but this is why the yellow auras are good. Things like Genesis, Merciful, Arclight, Sentinel, they can translate these extra cards into doing stuff because we are limited to three attacks, right? We can attack with two angels and one herald or two heralds and one angel per turn maybe get a bit lucky and sometimes a fourth if they pop on the last attack um, and you can maybe squeeze another herald attack in there but it's it's pretty difficult and say for the most part we're, we're locked to, to three attacks of the turn but it's generally more than enough uh, outside of these big turns one key interaction to note with this 
is if you need a second card and soul, um, it can be reasonable to pop Halo um, just to get a second card and soul if you really, really need the pivot turn. But Halo is the most important card in your entire deck. It isn't your, where your power spike come, comes from. So consider your options um, and maybe Halo is better used for an alternate moment. Now, one of those ultimate moments might be with this one, Figment of Judgment. Figment of Judgment might read quite innocuous on the surface. Uh, when it enters the arena, you may have, uh, you may turn a card in any banished line face down. Now, what does that actually mean? What is that actually relevant for? Well, things like Katsu's hero ability, such as a combo card from his deck, banishes it face up. Uh, it can also be used for against things like Vincent when they banish a blood deck card like from their hand. When a card in the banish line is turned face down, uh, it's no longer being able to be interactive interacted with effectively. Um, so they can't play it, they, they can't do anything with it. It is basically poof into the void, gone forever. So these decks which generate value from the banish line, this can be an absolute hoser. And just the existence of your halo being in play and being able to search this at any moment can really, really change your opponent's play patterns because they don't want to get blown out by something like Figment of Judgment. Absolutely, absolutely, completely ruthless um, when, when it can come up. And then we have Herald of Figment of Protection. Uh, Figment of Protection simply states make a Spectral Shield. Uh, I've talked about how good Spectral Shields are in this deck. I'm not going to go at length and more with, with this one. I think you guys understand how good this one is. Helps you protect your other angels. Um, now, the, some of these figments are what I like to call like throwaway uh, angels, where you're happy to transform them and not attack and get the effect. Um, protection, Erudition, Rebirth, those three, I think, are the, the highest value ones in terms of their, their hero effect. Also Ravages, to some extent, to close out games and more, more grindier. But as a, as a general sense, those first three are the, the most important. Uh, creating Spectral Shields, simply, simply put, makes it easier to defend your Angels, get more value. Erudition draws you cards. Drawing cards is broken. One of the best things you can do in the game, uh, period. And uh, Rebirth, uh, which is the... Third one I mentioned has a really, really interesting effect. Now, the figment side of it isn't too amazing. Uh, it basically just gives you an extra card in deck um, for the, the grinding matchups. But the other side says when you attack with it, you can stack any yellow card to the top of your deck. This means the dreaded Arclight Sentinel Loop um, is a thing where you're able to just play it turn after turn for the measly cost of one soul. Uh, it can come up. Uh, however, I don't think that's necessarily the game plan you're playing towards. It's more something that you get into during the game. When it's played towards actively, it can be a struggle to get there. Um, and I don't think it's the best way to play the hero. Um, but it is very, very strong at recycling that. Also good at recycling other figments like Figment of Ravages. Um, a lot of decks don't play Arcane Barrier against you, which means that this is basically one point of unpreventable damage. Um, and then on the Angel side, it's two points per attack which means it can be very, very easily to nuke opponents down um, off of low life totals if they, if they want to get there. Because for the most part, Guardians are especially notorious for it. They're, they're happy just to eat the vanilla damage from your angels a lot of the time. Um, so you can really, really punish them for that. One key interaction with Figment of Ravages is when you activate Halo of Illumination, you search this out, it can deal one damage to any target. All right, so that's not just your opponent, it's not just your opponent's dragons, and it's also yourself. Now, your angels have a funny little mechanic called ward, right? Uh, wards normally used to stop your opponent's damage. Uh, but in this case, if your opponent attacks, a, say they have a scar for a scar, and they start their turn on lower life, and they're like, look, all right, we're going to get this angel out of the way. Attack with scar for a scar, targeting your angel. But you can go, well, good sir, you still have three cards in hand in an arsenal. I'm going to pitch, pop Halo, search for the Ravages, ping myself, and I will choose for the Angel's Ward 4 to replace the damage. Destroying itself, stopping the Scar from the Scar from getting go again, and essentially saying, you don't have an action point, you can't do anything, it's my turn now. Really, really powerful effect. Massive gotcha for people who haven't played against it before. Um, so if you're watching this video to learn more about how to play against Prism, uh, that is one key thing to note, is 
please, please, please think before you uh, swing into an angel with an open halo up. It can be extremely, extremely devastating. And then we have Figment of Triumph. Really, really good at stopping your opponent from popping with sixes on your turn using Halo if you have to. Um, the flip side comes up sometimes. Um, the angel attack effect can be good versus these go wide strategies like Phi, for instance, where they attack with a lot of small attack actions per turn. It can be good there. Uh, but overall, it's other than the, the first stated use of it, it's, it's fine. It's good. It has its place in the deck. And then we have Figment of War. Now, notably, you'll notice that the only Figment uh, that's missing here is Figment of uh, Tenacity, I believe, which is the one that gives Dominate, which I, I believe to be probably the, no, definitely than the worst of the Figments. Um, the only time you'd probably want to play it uh, in your deck is when you're getting into these more grindy matchups, like you're playing against a lot of Assassins, where it comes up more often where you're having to go through all your Figments and actually running out of them. Um, playing 8 can be good for that exact reason. I find 7 is a nice place. I, I really like this lineup of figments. And I, I think that this, this looks right to me. Um, I, I would choose to play 7. Figment of War, uh, when it enters the arena, you create a courage token. Nice plus 1. Turns your, basically upgrades your hero to tier, right? Turns your blues into yellows, your yellows into reds. Your reds into super reds! Um, but it's, it's really, really nice at making it harder for your opponent to be able to block out efficiently. Just nice little bit of upside there. You won't really use the uh, Angel's effect on the other side. It never really comes up uh, over hundreds of games. It only, has only come up maybe once or twice. So you can just typically a little bit more of a throwaway Angel. Then we go on to some of the auras. So we have Genesis. Um, for those of you who don't know how, how powerful this card is, this is basically Arclight Sentinel, <laughs> the smaller version. Uh, and that's because the effect is so, so strong, being able to fill your soul, turn on uh, your vestige, uh, make shields to protect your angels, uh, let you see more cards per turn. This card really does it all, um, and it is so valuable that it's basically kill on sight. Um, if you're not killing me with the attack that you would other be, otherwise be throwing at the Genesis, you should be throwing it at the Genesis. That's how powerful this card is uh, when it's on the board. It is very, very, very strong. Um, again, the yellow aura is fantastic for being able to utilize those extra cards in hand from drawing things uh, like Angels, like Erudition, um, things like Tome of Divinity. You have all these extra cards in hand. Converting them into auras is one of the strongest things you can do um, after you, you complete your three attacks for the turn, obviously. Uh, Herald of Erudition. This one will probably always be good. Um, anything that says when it hits, draw two cards, eh, it has to have a lot of downsides, and this only has upsides. So it's a, it's a two for five, so it's a, a little bit on curve. Uh, yellow two five is a, is a reasonable stat without Phantasm, but it also has Dominate. So uh, and this in conjunction with Angelic Wrath uh, can be really, really nice. Um, being able to unexpectedly push through. Also with the blue aura that gives your, your first illusion attack plus two. Uh, great use case for using the Dreamweavers equipment um, is starting your turn with Dreamweavers, attack with Herald of Erudition, pump it with an Angelic Wrath to get it over your defense, and then boom, two more cards in hand, search for a figment, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, that's why I was talking about earlier for the, the red hero that they weren't playing with Dominate. Dominate is a very, very powerful effect um, in this deck. Guaranteeing the on hit uh, is extremely, extremely devastating. Now, we see the one copy of Herald of Tenacity in this deck. I actually think this card's pretty good. Um, I agree that it's a little bit underrated compared to the other heralds. So if you're just wanting the raw numbers, um, I can definitely see an argument for not playing this card. However, dominating some matchups is just absolutely backbreaking. Being able to guarantee a figment um, can be make or break on a game. Um, and this card does a good job of it. And then we have a little bit more of a spicy one. Uh, Herald of Judgment. So when <laughs> Herald of Judgment hits, uh, it goes into your soul like all the other heralds, but it also has a on-hit effect that says they can't play cards from their banish zone until the end of the next turn. Now this was famously mostly used against Chain back in the day. In fact, it might come up in Living Legend these days. Um, but has some niche uses against things like Katsu. Um, and obviously if you 
we're thinking that this worked with possibly one of the, the new part of file here is new. Uh, new plays it from your banish zone. So it does get around this effect, but any hero that's getting value from playing cards from their banish zone will be affected by this. That's a two for six, it's fine. It has a little bit of upside. It is good versus Katsu. I can see why that included it. Um, there isn't obviously an argument uh, if you want to play something a little bit more tilted towards grindier matchups. Um, the, you can go with another Herald effect, like more of the Dominate Heralds, or Herald of Rebirth um, is another option. Herald of Protection, we've talked so much about Protection at this point, just gonna move on. Card's great, 10 out of 10. Triumph, 10 out of 10, best, best Heralds. Now we have a slightly spicy card here. Invoke Soraya, now you don't see a lot of Prisms playing this card. It, it is, it's a pretty uh, scary price tag if you want the Cold Foil, um, but Invoke Soraya says, transform target Spectral Shield you control into Soraya, Arcane Herald, go again. Now, Soraya is a really interesting one because you need to have a Spectral Shield in play, which is actually kind of difficult, right? Like, outside of searching your, your Figment to create the Spectral Shield, um, you have to be hitting with a Herald of Protection, which is very hard to do reliably. Um, same thing with Genesis, it's pretty hard to reliably have Genesis in place because of how big of a target it is. Um, that being said, this card is yellow, it defends for three, it meets the criteria of being a reasonable card in this deck. And when you do get the flip um, in some aggro matchups, it can be really strong, right? Whenever Soraya deals damage, you gain that much life um, and can convert uh, your soul into sources of arcane damage, which, as I mentioned with Ravage, is also a really strong effect. Uh, so it does have a strong use case. Um, it really, really just depends how you want to slant your prism deck. I could also see an argument for things like, is that all you got uh, against these small weapon decks, like Azuri or Pistol Dash? really really good in those matchups um, so I, I can see the argument for the deck I personally think that the the deck needs a little bit more resilience in those kind of matchups which is why I prefer different tech choices but I can see why they played it and obviously they went on a tier with it and they hopefully got some good moments with this card Light of Soul another fabled um, Light of Soul and when it's pitched you reveal the top card of your deck and if it's yellow it goes in your soul Yes, that does mean that if a Herald goes in, you do get the search, which is pretty hot uh, when it happens. Playing more pearls in the deck, obviously a cost. Um, the card's pretty good. Do I think it's necessary? No, no, I, I don't think this card is necessary at all. Card, very powerful. I would play it in my prism deck, um, but it's not all upside. Also, I just wanted to mention this card's very important for uh, Guardian and Brute matchups. As Soul Generation, you can really struggle with it um, sometimes outside of a fix like Merciful Retribution. The number one reason why the Guardian matchup is not a, dare I say it, a 100-0. Uh, this, this card puts in so much work. So, so, so much work. Um, every time they pop one of your heroes with Merciful Retribution play, that hero goes to soul anyway, you get your figment anyway, you get arcane damage anyway. It literally does it all. It's everything you want in the matchup in a card. Um, and if you're playing against this card, being on those like grindier decks, you should destroy this. Um, that's very, very, very powerful. And we've talked about how good the yellow auras are in, this, in, in those kind of matchups anyway. Um, and yeah. Great, great card. Soul Shield, freest card of all time in this deck. It's yellow, it's a defense reaction, puts a card into your soul, it powers up your, your angel's attack abilities, uh, and yeah, it's just, it, it's great. I, uh, I, I wouldn't ever dream of the cutting this card. This card's fantastic. Definitely a must, must include for the deck. And then we got Tome of Divinity. Now, you never play this card in your deck when you're playing the, the Rapture, the chest piece. You will definitely slide this card out. However, with Rapture, uh, it simply states, when a card has gone to your soul this turn, pitch a blue, draw three cards. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of value, right? Like, a lot of value. Especially, I've seen people chain two or three times together. Because right when you're seeing three more cards, you're like, ah, oh, well, there's another blue. Oh, I found another Tome of Divinity. All right, chip it. And you can go through a lot of cards in this deck. You can draw a ton of cards, do a lot of things. That's why I, at the start of this video, I, I went on such a tangent of being like, Prism can do so, so many powerful things. And a lot of that comes from Tome of Divinity, right? You can string together some monstrous, monstrous stuff. Fantastic card um, and those grinding matchups where you need to establish multiple auras on board at the same time. Um, really, really important there. Don't really need it in some of these other matchups. So I can definitely see 
an argument for cutting cards like Tome of Divinity um, and some of the your aura effects like Genesis even, um, Merciful Retribution, trimming Arclight Sentinels, that kind of thing. You can definitely trim down on those um, for those matchups uh, and be completely fine. One card that isn't here that I personally really, really like is Celestial Reprimand. Now, Celestial Reprimand is a yellow zero, well, you want to play the yellow, the yellow zero cost instant. Target attack action card, defending a card with uh, Herald in its name, gets minus two power. So what that means is uh, they try and pop your attack with a six power, seven power, or even an eight power if it's a, a Herald of Triumph that you're attacking with. Uh, means it no longer pops. Um, and a lot of the defenses are often planned around that attack being popped. It basically forces the attack through, you get the on hit, you get all that good stuff. Fan fantastic card, especially for something like Brute, where you really need those tricks. Um, things like Angelic Wrath, um, Celestial Reprimand are really, really important there. Now, obviously, they were like, look, uh, I don't think I'm going to see that much like on the day. I'm going to trim this for some other more aggro focus tools like Invoke Soraya, which totally, totally defensible. Now, that's the deck. I've gone through pretty much everything. Um, there's a lot of nuance to, to playing this deck, a lot of really like small key interactions. I hope me talking through all the options has been of uh, some use. If not, hopefully some entertainment. Um, but I really, really enjoy playing this deck. This deck's very, very fun. You're typically just trying to play an aggressive game plan, attack with one to two heroes a turn, get your value from your angel, play a lot of games with this deck. You will learn a lot playing the deck. You will get the nuance of each individual matchup. And this is not something I'd recommend for you to just pick up and put down. Um, it's very, very hard to, to get into the deck, into the, to the meat of it, and really be able to extract the, the, the juicy power that lies, lies within. Uh, it really does need a lot of time to kind of work through it. But it's in a very rewarding deck to play. Um, it's probably, no, it is my, my favorite deck, um, even in current development uh, here at LSS. Simply because I really enjoy the puzzle it presents, uh, all the lines it gives you access to, and I feel like you really do have all the tools for every matchup if you try and find a way. So don't ever feel hopeless. Find the light at a ProQuest near you, and maybe you'll consider taking Prism or Ignorant of Soul. Catch you later, guys.